Jacob Kingston took a sip of whiskey before picking up his tablet. His wife's text informed him of another late night at work, leaving him to fend for dinner solo. Known for his meticulous routines, Jacob quickly made a plan. With unexpected free time that evening, he decided to enjoy a juicy cheeseburger, dive into an engrossing book, and open a prized bottle of whiskey saved for just such moments. As he savored the amber liquid, he put aside his tablet, reflecting on his circumstances with each sip. In the last half year, Amanda, Jacob's wife of six years, had been putting in many overtime hours. At the start of their marriage, they had set up a financial agreement, both deposited equal amounts into their joint account for expenses and trips, while maintaining separate personal savings, checking, and retirement accounts that they kept private from each other. Amanda's fixed salary meant her income remained constant regardless of her workload, whether she worked 40 hours or 60 hours a week. With their separate accounts, Jacob was unaware of the full extent of Amanda's overtime earnings. Their contributions to the joint account regularly exceeded expenses, resulting in a significant surplus. Before they got married, Amanda had insisted on maintaining separate accounts, a stipulation that Jacob had agreed to. When they met, Jacob's business faced turbulent times amid a sluggish economy. There were stretches when he chose not to pay himself, a plight familiar to many business owners where creditors often come before personal paychecks. Despite financial strain, Jacob adamantly refused layoffs, dipping into his personal savings to uphold his commitment to job security. It was a relentless march forward, each day ending with closed shop doors and the weight of debt pressing harder upon him. Amanda, employed as a staff accountant at a Fortune 500 company, maintained a deliberate distance from Jacob's business affairs, fearing its potential collapse amid challenging times. Jacob, conscious of this concern, shielded Amanda from the financial strain by relying on his savings, sparing her any burdens. Though occasionally challenged to fulfill their joint account obligations, Jacob consistently contributed his share, trusting that the adversity would eventually subside. Jacob not only endured but flourished amidst adversity. Inheriting three auto repair shops from his father, he transformed them into a thriving chain of 12 locations within a few years, with plans to expand to 20 in the near future. Despite the profitability of his enterprise, Jacob opted for a modest salary, channeling the bulk of profits back into the business. Each location boasted top-of-the-line tire equipment capable of handling any wheel size, while state-of-the-art diagnostic tools enabled technicians to address virtually any vehicle issue from North American, Asian, and European manufacturers, except those from France. Despite their professional successes, cracks began to surface in Jacob and Amanda's marriage, casting a shadow over what should have been the happiest period of their lives. This was the second marriage for both Jacob and Amanda. Jacob's first wife died under tragic circumstances. She was the only woman close to him as his mother passed away when he was in middle school. It took Jacob several months to recover from Marie's death. His dad appointed an acting manager at the store Jacob ran, giving Jacob time to grieve for the wife and children he would never have. Jacob might never have recovered if his father hadn't suffered a fatal heart attack one night while driving home from his office store. It made Jacob forget his pain and focus on business. People's livelihoods depended on it. As Jacob strolled past a mechanic, an apprentice recklessly removed the radiator cap, resulting in scalding antifreeze splashing onto Jacob's chest, leading to an emergency room visit. The bustling waiting area teemed with the typical mix of visitors found in any city. Despite his unfortunate appearance, drenched in a greenish fluid with a faintly sweet yet unpleasant odor, Jacob seemed unassuming as he occupied an empty seat. A tall, attractive brunette nursing a hop and a limp made her way toward Jacob and settled into the vacant seat beside him. With the ER packed, both Jacob and the brunette, Amanda, knew they were in for a lengthy wait. As they exchanged tales of their injuries, Amanda had twisted her ankle during an after-work run. They also shared snippets of their lives. 
an instant connection sparked between them, leading Jacob to boldly invite Amanda to dinner, an invitation she eagerly accepted. Their chemistry was palpable, quickly solidifying into a relationship. Amanda, scarred by her previous marriage marred by emotional abuse and infidelity, made it clear from their first date that she had no tolerance for cheating. Despite this, their bond deepened, culminating in marriage 15 months after their initial meeting. As Jacob sipped his whiskey, he couldn't help but reflect on his marriage. The old joke rang in his mind, we've had a happy marriage for five years. Unfortunately, we got married six years ago. In the early years, Jacob and Amanda reveled in ecstatic happiness. They laughed, danced, and shared intimate moments frequently, their connection seemingly unbreakable. However, challenges arose after Amanda completed her MBA and transitioned to a new role as an accountant in a Fortune 500 corporation. Jacob wholeheartedly supported her career aspirations, desiring nothing but happiness and success for his wife. As the retirement of a senior vice president loaned, Amanda eyed the opportunity for a promotion. With her senior director's impending promotion leaving a vacant position, confident in her abilities, she set out to demonstrate her enthusiasm for the role. Over time, Jacob noticed a change in Amanda's behavior. Kendall, the senior director, grew increasingly curt with Jacob, seemingly finding fault in everything he did. Amanda, too, began to show disdain for Jacob's profession, reducing him to nothing more than a mere mechanic, a grease monkey in her eyes. Their conversations became laced with disrespect, and Amanda's constant frustration and anger towards Jacob became a toxic element in their marriage. To avoid him, Amanda buried herself in overtime work, and even when at home, she was glued to her phone, texting incessantly. Jacob grew to resent Amanda's phone, which seemed to consume her attention. She guarded it fiercely, concealing her messages and laughing at them in secrecy. It became routine for her to sleep with the phone tucked under her pillow. Then the situation took a dark turn, descending into violence. Amanda's temper was a long-standing trait, often manifesting itself in harsh remarks and barbs. When she lost her temper, she quickly calmed down and made amends, and when Jacob was the object of her anger, her remorse led to a wonderful night of reconciliation. But Jacob began to notice a disturbing trend. Amanda's outbursts were becoming more frequent and intense, and the intimacy that had made her temper more tolerable seemed to be waning. He worried about the state of their relationship. A month ago, amidst an argument sparked by Amanda over seemingly trivial matters, she crossed the line by slapping Jacob, an act completely out of character for both of them in their six years of marriage. The shock of the slap reverberated through Jacob to his core, leaving both parties stunned. Amanda quickly realized her mistake, offering apologies and pleading for forgiveness. However, the incident foreshadowed darker times to come. A week later, tensions escalated further when Amanda berated Jacob for not attending to the oil change light in her Audi. Despite Jacob's explanation that the car was entitled to free oil changes for the initial three years, Amanda's frustration boiled over, resorting to insults. Fed up with her behavior, Jacob decided he'd had enough. He confronted Amanda, expressing his disapproval of her choice to purchase the expensive and unreliable German car, reminding her that its maintenance was her responsibility. Amanda's reaction was explosive. She grabbed her coffee cup and hurled it at Jacob, narrowly missing him as he dodged the projectile. Shocked by her aggression, Jacob stared at Amanda in disbelief, met with her cold, emotionless gaze as she turned and walked away without a word. Jacob took a sip of his whiskey as he heard the garage door announce Amanda's arrival. With a swift movement, he picked up his cell phone and sent out both a text and an email he had prepared earlier. They were duplicates, destined for the same recipient, and carrying identical information. For Jacob, redundancy was a fundamental principle. As the lyrics of Tennessee Ernie Ford's song echoed in his mind, he believed in the wisdom of backup plans. If the right one don't get you, then the left one will. 
As Amanda passed through the living room, her gaze fell upon Jacob lounging comfortably in his armchair with a glass of whiskey in hand. I'm going to change, and then we need to discuss some unusual activity on the joint account, Amanda announced, without waiting for Jacob's response, before disappearing into the bedroom. Minutes later, the sound of the shower filled the air. Both Jacob and Amanda had set up notifications on their banking apps to alert them of any irregularities. Jacob had received the same alerts that now seemed to be causing Amanda concern. With a sigh, he set aside his iPad and took a sip of whiskey, awaiting Amanda's return. Fifteen minutes later, Amanda emerged from the bedroom dressed in black yoga pants and a white midriff-bearing t-shirt, her hair still damp from the shower. Despite the absence of makeup, she exuded a stunning beauty. Her slender, athletic frame captivated Jacob's attention as she settled onto the sofa opposite him. Do you know about these deductions from the joint account? Amanda inquired, her tone carrying a hint of accusation as. She held up her phone, displaying their bank's app with a significantly reduced balance. Earlier in the day, it had shown a balance of over $30,000, but now it displayed a mere $12. Jacob nodded in acknowledgement. The $112,000 debit to PDSD, that's Pendant Security Consultants. I hired them to surveil you for a month and document your affair with your boss. And the $188,000 transfer to SKD, that was the retainer for Simmons, Kennedy, and Dixon, my divorce attorneys, Jacob explained calmly, taking another sip of whiskey as he observed Amanda's reaction. Tears welled in Amanda's eyes, her mouth opening and closing in a desperate search for words. Her face flushed with emotion, cycling through fear, sadness, and anger, leaving her momentarily speechless. Jacob observed her turmoil, witnessing the rapid shift of emotions, but it wasn't until he reached for his whiskey glass that Amanda seemed to gather her thoughts and find her voice. It didn't mean anything, Amanda finally spoke, her words tinged with desperation. I just got carried away, but I can end it now. I don't want a divorce. Weren't you the one who said she had zero tolerance for cheaters? What does that mean to you? Jacob countered. If you ever cheated on me, I would divorce you, Amanda replied, her hands clenched in her lap, her gaze fixed downwards. That sounds like a prudent stance, Jacob remarked dryly. I don't want a divorce, Amanda reiterated. What did you expect would happen when I found out? Jacob pressed. I didn't think you would find out, Amanda admitted, her honesty cutting through the tension. I thought it would end and we could go back to normal. And what about the disrespect? The anger? Was I just supposed to overlook that? Jacob challenged. I never disrespected you, and there was no abuse, Amanda protested, her voice rising slightly in defense. You were in our bed with him, Jacob questioned, his tone firm. Amanda gasped, her face draining of color. Yes, she admitted softly, but I didn't mean to disrespect you. Well, that's just great. As long as you didn't intend to disrespect me, then I suppose it's all forgiven, Jacob retorted, his tone laced with simmering anger. You slept with your lover in our bed, in our home, and you don't see how that was disrespectful to me? And you claim there wasn't any abuse? Jacob scoffed incredulously. You slapped me and hurled a coffee cup at my head. That's textbook abuse. We can move past this. I don't want a divorce, Amanda insisted, her voice tinged with urgency. We can seek help from a marriage counselor. Jacob shook his head resolutely. Our marriage wasn't the issue, your infidelity was. Counseling is necessary, but not to salvage our marriage. You need to address whatever issues led you to cheat. If your boyfriend were available, you'd be out the door in a heartbeat. I'm not your backup plan. I don't want a divorce, Amanda repeated adamantly. You can change your mind, Jacob remarked wryly. 
Throughout their conversation, Amanda's phone had been buzzing incessantly with notifications, which she had been ignoring in favor of pleading her case to Jacob. As another call came in, she sighed in annoyance, prompting Jacob to gesture towards her phone. You might want to take that, he suggested. Amanda rose from the sofa and retreated to the other room. Jacob shook his head, chuckling softly. It was surreal to witness the convoluted rationale of cheaters, even more so when it came from his own wife. This is a private matter between you and me. You had no business meddling in their marriage, Amanda's face glowed crimson with rage. Your boyfriend didn't hesitate to interfere in my marriage, so I had no qualms about interfering in his. If he's cheating on her with a co-worker, who knows how many other women he's involved with. She needs to protect herself and get tested for STIs, Jacob retorted. He's not like that. He's clean, Amanda said defensively. Since the first thing you do when you get home after a late day at work is take a shower. I'm assuming you're sleeping with him without protection. You should get tested too. I got tested for my own peace of mind, even though you and I haven't had anything since you started your affair, Jacob stated. Amanda stared at her husband in disbelief. He had been aware of her affair for months and had quietly orchestrated his response, all the while maintaining a facade of normalcy. Who is this man she thought she knew? You're just seeking revenge. You're pathetic, Amanda spat out, her voice tinged with disbelief once again. Jacob couldn't help but notice the constant buzzing of her phone, ignored amidst her barrage of insults. As she momentarily paused, her phone began to ring. You might want to take that call, Jacob suggested calmly, taking another sip of whiskey. Without a word, Amanda stormed towards the bedroom to answer her phone, leaving Jacob to his own devices. Seizing the opportunity, Jacob swiftly made a call on his iPhone, murmuring into the receiver before activating the recording app. Placing the phone strategically against the lamp on the end table, he ensured that the conversation would be captured on video while keeping the line open for the other party to hear. It wasn't long before Amanda stormed back into the living room, her face contorted with rage. You posted this on Facebook, she bellowed, her voice echoing through the room. And you tagged all my family and friends? You even tagged Pastor Derek. Jacob remained composed, nodding in affirmation. Yes, but I also shared it on LinkedIn, ensuring all your professional connections could see it too. Amanda's frustration and anger boiled over, manifesting in a piercing scream before she hurled her cell phone at Jacob's head. Anticipating the impact, he instinctively shut his eyes, bracing himself for the blow. The collision was far more intense than he had imagined, nearly causing him to lose consciousness as the phone struck his forehead. Despite the shock, he managed to retain his composure. He knew she was going to do something about it, and not answering her was one of the hardest things he'd ever had to do. Amanda lunged across the gap between them, raining blows upon Jacob's face. A punch to the nose caused his vision to blur momentarily. Eventually, he could no longer restrain himself and instinctively shielded his face with his arms as Amanda relentlessly assaulted him. Amidst her screams of threats, Jacob's resolve reached its breaking point. Gently, he pushed her away and rose to his feet, putting distance between them. With a silent prayer, he hoped that the 911 operator he had contacted would dispatch help swiftly. True to his hope, a squad car arrived just minutes later, exactly as he had envisioned. Amanda's gaze bore into Jacob with venomous intensity, her mind racing with strategies to retaliate against him. Before she could decide on a course of action, the doorbell shattered the tense silence. You should probably get that, Jacob's voice remained calm, devoid of emotion. Amanda's nostrils flared, her eyes narrowing as she locked eyes with Jacob. With a sharp pivot, she marched towards the front door, flinging it open. Amanda found herself face to face with two police officers. 
Confusion mingled with anger as she engaged in a heated exchange with the officers, shooting accusatory glances back at Jacob between sentences. Though their conversation was too distant for Jacob to decipher, Amanda's animated gestures and pointed finger left little to the imagination. Eventually, she stepped aside to allow the officers entry into their home, one of them making their way towards Jacob. Mr. Kingston, I'm Patrolman Peter and my partner is Patrolman Terry. Your wife mentioned that there's been violence tonight. Can you tell me what's going on? Did you lay a hand on her? Patrolman Peter inquired. Shaking his head, Jacob denied the accusation. I confronted my wife about her affair, and she attacked me, he explained, gesturing towards his face where he could feel the sting of the blow from the thrown cell phone and the split lip. I'm the one who called 911. She's been getting increasingly violent lately. A month ago, she slapped me, and then a week later, she threw a coffee cup at my head. It narrowly missed, but if it had hit, I would have ended up in the emergency room. I have a recording of tonight's confrontation. Would you like to see it? Patrolman Peter's expression shifted, clearly interested in viewing the evidence. Jacob performed a series of taps on his iPhone before handing it over to Patrolman Peter. With furrowed brows, the officer watched the video in silence, his expression shifting as he observed Amanda's aggressive actions towards Jacob. Turning back to Jacob, Patrolman Peter regarded him skeptically. It seems there was some conversation before the recording. Did anything said escalate the situation? Jacob shrugged. She found out I had hired a private investigator to tail her for a month and that I shared the findings with her affair partner's wife. Needless to say, she wasn't pleased. The officer chuckled. You don't do things by halves, do you? As the saying goes, I light my path forward by the light of the fires of the bridges burning behind me, Jacob replied dryly. Fair enough, Patrolman Peter said with a shake of his head, a smile playing on his lips. Exiting briefly to confer with his partner, they reviewed the situation. Returning, they seemed to have reached a conclusion. We're arresting your wife for domestic violence and threats, Patrolman Peter informed Jacob. I'd suggest getting a restraining order. As Amanda was escorted out in handcuffs, she turned to Jacob, tears streaming down her face, pleading desperately. Jacob, please don't let them do this to me. If you've ever loved me, make them let me go. I'll be good, I promise. Jacob rolled his eyes, accepting a business card from Patrolman Peter. My email's on the card. Send me the video, the officer instructed. As the squad car drove away, Jacob wasted no time in contacting his attorney, Frank Simmons. It played out just as expected. She's been arrested and taken to jail. Stay calm, Jacob. If she shows up again, you know what to do, Frank advised. Exiting the courthouse the following morning, Amanda found herself accosted by a young blonde woman, seemingly nonchalant as she chewed her gum. Excuse me, the blonde interrupted Amanda's path. Are you Amanda Kingston? Wearily, Amanda confirmed her identity. Yes. Who are you? You've been served, the blonde stated matter-of-factly, thrusting a manila envelope into Amanda's hands before turning to leave. What is this? Amanda called after her, her annoyance palpable. Don't know, don't care, the blonde retorted, her voice fading as she walked away. But I'd say you're probably screwed, whatever it is. Frustrated, Amanda tore open the envelope to find a petition for dissolution of marriage. What a bastard, she exclaimed, her anger bubbling over as she turned to her parents for support. It had been a grueling morning for Amanda. Dragged out of her jail cell early, she had been relocated to a holding area within the courthouse where she spent an agonizing hour before meeting with her attorney. With only one phone call the previous night, she had reached out to her parents, who had scrambled to find legal representation for her. Thankfully, they had secured a lawyer overnight, 
providing Amanda with some reassurance as she faced her hearing. The judge had set bail at $10,000, requiring her to either pay the full amount or enlist the services of a bail bondsman and pledge real property as collateral, paying 10% of the bond. Additionally, a restraining order was issued, prohibiting her from contacting her husband or visiting his residence or workplace. Arrangements were to be made through her attorney for retrieving her belongings from the residence. Initially, Amanda's lawyer objected to these terms, but withdrew the objection after being shown photos of Amanda's husband. Leaving the courthouse, Amanda's parents treated her to a stop at a McDonald's drive through as a first order of business. Having been booked into Denton County Jail too late for dinner and roused early for her court appearance, she had missed breakfast. The previous night, Amanda had foregone dinner, opting instead to spend the evening in bed with her boss, Paul. Her plan to grab leftovers upon returning home had been foiled. Reflecting on how she ended up in this situation, she remembered the moment her evening took a drastic turn. As she and Paul were spending time together, Amanda's phone buzzed, interrupting their moment of intimacy. Expecting a text from Jacob, she glanced at her phone only to be met with a low-balance alert from her bank. Logging into the bank's app, she discovered that their joint account was nearly empty, with two significant withdrawals totaling $30,000. A quick Google search of the payees yielded no results. Amanda considered the possibilities that could explain the depleted checking account. It could be a scam or a banking error, she reasoned, drawing on her intellect. Another possibility loaned, one she hesitated to entertain, Jacob might have discovered her. A fair and emptied the account in response, yet she found it difficult to believe. She knew her husband well, he was not one to shy away from confrontation. If he suspected her infidelity, he would have confronted her directly. Jacob Kingston was not the type to ignore such matters. Despite her certainty, Amanda found herself in a dingy motel room, lying next to her boss and grappling with doubts about her choices. Throughout her life, Amanda had found things coming easily to her. She was accustomed to being both the smartest and the prettiest girl in her class, though this often left her isolated from her peers who mistrusted her. Early on, she had learned to wield her attractiveness as a tool, employing it without hesitation. In her teenage years, she eschewed high school boys in favor of older, more accomplished men with stable careers. College was a repeat of high school. If she had trouble with her classes, she had affairs with professors. She graduated from college in four years with a finance degree. She considered law school but knew she wasn't a strong enough student. To Amanda, her affair with Paul Ramirez, the senior director she reported to, held no sentimental value. It was merely a means to an end. Her journey into infidelity had begun during her tenure at Chase Bank in her second year when she crossed paths with Anthony Cooper. Anthony, assigned to investigate possible money laundering activities, exuded a carefree demeanor that immediately piqued Amanda's interest. Boldly, she invited him for drinks, and by the end of their first date, they were in bed together. Amanda found herself enamored with Anthony. Within two months, they were cohabiting, and a year later, they tied the knot. Initially, married life with Anthony was blissful for Amanda. She adored him and was committed to ensuring his happiness. Together, they seemed perfect. However, cracks began to appear after four years of marriage, during which they actively pursued starting a family. Anthony received an opportunity to attend a four-week course conducted by alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Although his absence would be temporary, Amanda understood the career benefits and encouraged him to seize the opportunity. The first week without Anthony was manageable for Amanda, but as the days passed, her loneliness deepened. By the second week, exacerbated by hormonal fluctuations, her yearning for Anthony intensified. As the third week drew to a close, Amanda found herself teetering on the edge. Finally, in the fourth week, she succumbed to her vulnerabilities, agreeing to drinks with Bob Collins. 
Bob Collins, an ex-partner of Amanda's husband in the Denton County Sheriff's Department, had drifted apart from Anthony, though Amanda couldn't pinpoint the exact cause of their rift. Nevertheless, she agreed to meet Bob for drinks, harboring a vague hope of reconciling their differences. Besides, Bob's charm and her own loneliness made the invitation appealing. What harm could it do? Meanwhile, Anthony had excelled in the ATF class, emerging as the top performer. As the final week approached, his stellar performance afforded him the opportunity to take the exam early. Passing would grant him an early departure, failing would mean remaining until the class concluded. Following his success, Anthony wasted no time in catching a flight back home to surprise his wife. Arriving in the early hours of the morning, he was dropped off by an Uber, greeted by the sight of Bob's car parked in their driveway. A surge of apprehension gripped Anthony as he entered their darkened home, leaving his suitcase by the door. As he tiptoed towards the bedroom, the room basked in the soft glow emanating from the master bathroom. Anthony retrieved his phone and commenced filming the slumbering couple. After capturing 30 seconds of footage, he snapped a few pictures before stashing the device away. Sauntering over to Bob's side of the bed, he delivered an impish slap. The scream that came out of Bob's mouth woke Amanda from her sleep. When she awoke, she was startled and disoriented. She saw Bob crying and holding his cheek with both hands. Her husband was standing over them, but for a moment, her brain couldn't comprehend what was happening. Then everything fell into place. Amanda's expression morphed from shock to terror as she processed the gravity of the situation. Her soon-to-be ex-husband's rage was palpable as he issued his ultimatum. I'll return at three o'clock to collect my belongings. I expect you to be gone by then, Anthony's voice seethed with anger. If I find you here, I won't be accountable for my actions. You're not worth jeopardizing my job or freedom. With a firm grip, Anthony seized Bob by the hair, forcing their eyes to meet. His words dripped with contempt. You're despicable. I'll ensure your wife and HR see the video. Consider your career and marriage over. A final blow to Bob's nose left it bleeding as Anthony stormed out, leaving Amanda reflecting on Anthony's devastation upon discovering her infidelity. Amanda felt a pang of guilt despite. Her attempts to reconcile, he remained resolute in his silence, initiating divorce proceedings. Her parents, wanting to comfort her, shifted the blame to her husband, portraying Anthony as the aggressor and rewriting history. Amanda recast herself as the victim, portraying her departure as a brave escape from an abusive relationship. Anthony's confrontation with Bob only reinforced her narrative, further cementing her role as the hero of her own story. Amanda's encounter at Enstrom's department store in Dallas shattered the carefully constructed facade of her narrative. Standing face to face with her ex-husband Anthony, Amanda felt a rush of emotions she hadn't prepared for. Anthony was accompanied by a striking woman, tall and athletic with fiery red hair, who appeared vaguely familiar. Amanda's heart skipped a beat as she noticed the pram by her side. Hi, Anthony, Amanda's voice wavered as she greeted him. Hello, Amanda, Anthony replied, his tone devoid of warmth. Amanda extended her hand towards the woman. Hi, I'm Amanda. I used to be married to Anthony. Oh yes, I've heard about you, the woman, Melissa Parker, replied as she shook Amanda's hand. A flush of embarrassment crept up Amanda's neck. I'm sure you've heard mixed things, some good, some not so good, Melissa responded evenly. I'm Melissa Parker. I'm Anthony's wife. This is our son, Anthony Jr. Amanda glanced down at the sleeping infant, her heart aching with a mixture of longing and regret. He's a beautiful baby. You're fortunate to be married to Anthony. He's a good man, Amanda managed to force a smile. It was good seeing you again, Anthony, Amanda said. Anthony's gaze bore into her with a mixture of disdain and indifference as he swiftly led Melissa and their child away, leaving Amanda alone with her thoughts amidst the bustling department store. 
Days later, as Amanda tuned into the local evening news, she was startled to see the woman she had glimpsed with Anthony now gracing the screen as a news anchor. The pieces fell into place. Melissa Parker was the missing link. Amanda embarked on a Google search, revealing Melissa's burgeoning career in the media. Despite a twinge of jealousy, Amanda couldn't ignore the satisfaction of witnessing her ex's new life intertwined with hers night after night. Amanda battled conflicting emotions, her tears a testament to the inner turmoil. Yet, amid the emotional whirlwind, a familiar narrative emerged. Anthony was the instigator, wasn't he? His new marriage was bound to falter, wasn't it? With this counseling, not once. Amanda tethered herself to reality, pondering the ramifications of divorce. After hastily devouring her egg muffin, Amanda insisted her parents take her home, her determination unshaken. Ready to confront Jacob, she grappled with the impending upheaval. That's not a good idea, honey, her father cautioned. I need to talk to Jacob. I need to explain to him what happened. We can work through this, Amanda insisted. Ken, her mother, interjected, concern etched in her voice. I don't think that's a good idea. The judge said. I don't care what the judge said. Amanda snapped at her mother. Just take me home. As they stood outside her front door, Amanda's impatience grew. She rang the doorbell, but there was no response. With each unanswered ring, her frustration mounted, culminating in a barrage of pounding on the door. Inside, Jacob made a quick call, keeping the security chain in place before opening the door. You're not supposed to be here. There's a restraining order to keep you away, Jacob stated firmly. I live here, Amanda countered. How can we fix our marriage if I'm not here? Jacob's incredulous gaze met Amanda's. We're not fixing anything. I'm not going to stay married to a lying, abusive cheater. You need to get out of here, he declared, closing the door against her protests. Infuriated, Amanda continued to pound on the door, hurling insults and threats. Her parents joined in, their voices echoing her distress, amplifying the chaos. Open the door, Jacob, or I swear you're going to get hurt. Amanda yelled. Open the door, you dumb monkey. Amanda's father added, his frustration boiling over. Jacob took a sip of his coffee, his expression a mix of disbelief and resignation as he reviewed the footage captured by his doorbell camera, the arrival of the squad car, the officer's approach, and the subsequent conversation with his wife and her parents played out like a surreal drama. As one of the officers rang the doorbell in the video, Jacob recalled opening the door and welcoming law enforcement inside. After verifying his identity, the officer inquired about the visible injuries on Jacob's face, prompting him to recount the events of the previous night. Last night, I confronted my wife about an affair. She's having an affair, Jacob explained, gesturing to his bruised face. I hired a private investigator and have evidence of the affair. During the confrontation, she became violent and attacked me. Jacob handed the officer a copy of the restraining order issued against his wife, which barred her from returning to their residence. Then, he showed the officer the video footage captured on his phone, depicting Amanda and her parents making threats at his front door. The officer watched the video with a shake of his head, his expression reflecting the absurdity of the situation. Well, this seems pretty cut and dried. Send me a copy of the video, he instructed, handing Jacob a business card. He then radioed for additional units, anticipating multiple arrests. Stay inside and watch the show from your phone. Do not exit your house until I tell you, Jacob nodded in acknowledgement, understanding the gravity of the situation unfolding before him as he prepared to navigate the aftermath of his wife's violent outburst. That's precisely how it unfolded. The officer called his partner over for a consultation, and they reviewed the video on Jacob's phone before approaching Amanda and her parents. 
The trio was informed of their arrest for trespassing and menacing, with Amanda facing additional charges for violating the restraining order. With the arrival of two more squad cars, the officers proceeded to arrest Amanda and her parents. Chaos erupted as Amanda's mother became hysterical. Amanda herself burst into tears and hurled curses at the officers, while her father attempted to intervene and was promptly tackled to the ground. Shit, that was a rather tame way to describe the scene. Jacob wasted no time and immediately called his attorney, leaving the succinct message, Amanda and both of her parents were just arrested. I think I've married into a family of idiots. Robert Kling found himself grappling with defeat and despair. The events of Friday night had left him, his wife, and their daughter in handcuffs, arrested for trespassing and making threats against their son-in-law. Spending the entire weekend in jail, they awaited their Monday morning hearing before a judge. Both Robert and his wife were slapped with restraining orders commanding them to steer clear of Jacob's home and workplace. Meanwhile, Amanda had her bail revoked due to violating the protective order and menacing Jacob, ensuring her prolonged stay behind bars. Although Robert and his wife managed to secure their release, Amanda remained incarcerated indefinitely. As he reflected on these circumstances, Robert couldn't shake the feeling of parental failure. Amanda, once his cherished daughter, had become a personification of entitlement and narcissism. Despite this realization, she still held a special place in his heart. Throughout the weekend, Nicole, his wife, shared a cell with Amanda. Their conversations were veiled in secrecy. Upon her release, Nicole's demeanor hinted at a newfound determination, leaving Robert puzzled as to its source and purpose. Robert reached out to the attorney who had handled Amanda's previous arrest, only to learn that he was conveniently unavailable due to a coincidental vacation. Sensing a stroke of luck, Robert decided to seek legal counsel elsewhere. He scoured the yellow pages until he found an attorney willing to meet him promptly. Little did he know, this impulsive decision would serve as a harbinger of trouble. Kenneth Campbell, the attorney Robert stumbled upon, hardly fit the stereotypical image of a lawyer. With a gaunt frame, receding hairline, and a face reminiscent of a bird of prey, Kenneth exuded an aura of opportunism. Robert couldn't help but recall a phrase from his distant literature studies, something about a lean and hungry look. While some lawyers resorted to flashy TV commercials or billboard ads, Kenneth seemed like the type to promote his services in less reputable establishments, perhaps even on Fox News. As Robert presented him with a business card from Amanda's divorce packet, Kenneth's predatory grin faltered into a scowl. Simmons, Kennedy, and Dixon? This unexpected twist left Kenneth visibly displeased, prompting Robert to wonder what he had gotten himself into. So, your son-in-law is more of a tycoon than a grease monkey, Kenneth remarked, skepticism tainting his tone. Robert nodded. Exactly. He's got a whole empire of auto shops. Doubt he gets his hands dirty. Kenneth refrained from further inquiries, opting to rely on his own research. He swiftly navigated to his computer and initiated a Google search on Jacob Kingston of Kingston Automotive. Twelve thriving locations. Impressive. Looks like we've hit the jackpot. With a business like that, your daughter's divorce settlement could be substantial. And who knows, maybe he'll cover my fees too. Kenneth mused, his eyes gleaming with anticipation, metaphorically rubbing his hands together at the prospect of a lucrative case. Go screw yourself, Kenneth stared at his cell phone incredulously after leaving a message with Jacob's attorney, Frank Simmons, who had just returned his call. Kenneth demanded an urgent meeting with Jacob Kingston and his legal counsel to discuss temporary spousal maintenance. Frank's response was brief before he abruptly ended the call, fuming. Kenneth dialed Frank Simmons' number again, fully prepared to give him a piece of his mind about professional courtesy among colleagues in the legal field. What part of Go Screw Yourself did you not understand? Frank Simmons asked, without greeting or preamble. You want to play hardball, then we'll play hardball, Kenneth said to himself as he placed his cell phone down on his desk. 
Why didn't you inform me about the videos? Kenneth's voice reverberated through the room as he confronted his clients. Finally managing to reach someone at Simmons, Kennedy, and Dixon, Kenneth was greeted by a first associate tasked with scheduling a preliminary conference. It was made clear that Kenneth's clients need not attend this initial meeting. The entire conference proved to be a dismal affair for Kenneth. From the moment he stepped into the law offices of SKD to his hasty departure, each moment seemed designed to embarrass and undermine Kenneth Campbell, Esquire. It all started in the reception area where Kenneth announced himself to the receptionist. It felt as though he would have received a warmer reception if a stray dog had suddenly morphed into a lawyer and strolled in with a briefcase. Redirected to a small conference room, he was left to wait, assured that someone would attend to him shortly. Kenneth seated in the cramped room for what felt like an eternity after Carol's dismissive instruction to wait. When someone finally came to fetch him, it was a woman who appeared young enough to be a teenager in Kenneth's eyes. She seemed no more than a child, and he couldn't help but underestimate her. Little did he know, Carol Dixon was a Yale Law graduate in her thirties, propelled by her natural talent and family connections to become a junior partner at her firm. Kenneth remained oblivious to her accomplishments, writing her off with a single glance. As Kenneth entered the conference room, he was taken aback to find Carol seated across from him. Her demeanor shifted from mild amusement to something more predatory as Kenneth outlined his client's demands. However, his shock turned to bitterness as Carol swiftly dismantled his arguments. They have evidence of your daughter's violent behavior, violations of the restraining order, and even death threats from you and your wife, not to mention the prenuptial agreement you conveniently forgot to mention, Carol stated coolly. Kenneth felt his pride wounded by Carol's words. The entire ordeal had been a humiliating blow to his ego, and he couldn't contain his frustration. You've made me look like a rookie, not a seasoned lawyer with 30 years of experience, he snapped with a steely resolve. Carol delivered her verdict, I'm terminating our representation of you. Find another lawyer to handle your mess, and here's my invoice for the time wasted. Now get out of my office. Kenneth stormed out, seething with anger and humiliation, realizing he had underestimated Carol Dixon to his own detriment. Amanda and her parents sat across from Jacob in the conference room, their expressions filled with resentment. Amanda had meticulously dressed herself, hoping to showcase what Jacob would be losing, but Jacob remained calmly indifferent, unfazed by her attempts to elicit regret for their impending divorce. The terms of the divorce were straightforward, there wasn't much to divide. They agreed to retain their respective possessions brought into the marriage. Jacob, having bought the house prior to their union, would keep ownership, a decision Amanda interpreted as a lack of commitment. Jacob, on the other hand, saw it as a prudent safeguard against uncertainty. In hindsight, both perspectives held some truth. As part of the settlement, Jacob insisted on the return of Amanda's wedding set, and in return, he handed over his own ring. Amanda placed her rings in an envelope and passed it to Jacob, who simply moved his ring and pushed it across the table to her. Throughout the meeting, his ring sat untouched, a silent testament to the finality of their decision. As they stood together, an undeniable sense of finality pervaded the room. Jacob felt compelled to confront Amanda about the question that had been haunting him. Amanda, why? We built a life together, shared love. Why throw it all away for a brief affair? Amanda sighed deeply, her uncertainty palpable as she met Jacob's eyes. I wish I had a simple answer. Maybe it was restlessness, boredom, ambition, or all of those combined. What can I say? Do I regret hurting you? I regret the pain it caused, but not the act itself. It's a part of who I am. You were a good husband. I just couldn't be the wife you deserved, maybe not for anyone. Jacob nodded quietly, her words confirming his suspicions all along. Amanda gathered her things, ready to leave, but Jacob's voice halted her steps. Amanda, he called out, and she turned back to face him. 
he gestured towards his wedding ring still lying on the table. You should probably take that. Thank you all for taking the time to tune in today. If you enjoyed the stories, don't forget to like and subscribe. Feel free to share your thoughts on today's events in the comments below. Take care.